Okay, hello future MedDex. Welcome to our first lecture session for Principles of Medical Laboratory Science Practice 2. Okay, so for today's discussion, we have introduction to phlebotomy. You know? So we will know what it once was, what it is now, and what it will be in the near future. So for today's discussion, we have uh, phlebotomy in the past. Okay? So phlebotomy is the process of extracting blood. It came from two Greek words, phlebos, meaning vein, and temne, which means to make a cut or incision. Originally, phlebotomy pertains to blood collection in the veins. But in the current times, phlebotomy refers to all types of blood collection. It could be uh, venipuncture, arterial puncture, or uh, skin, or capillary puncture. Now before, whenever someone was sick, doctors would just perform bloodletting on the patient, and the patient was expected, mind you, expected, to recover from his sickness thereafter. So this type of practice can be traced as far back as in the Stone Age, where, of course, people use stones to bleed the patient out. So wasn't it barbaric? Of course, there was no concept of ethics and uh, humane practices before. So we never, we can never expect their processes to be anything but that. No, barbaric. However, today, the act of phlebotomy is not focused on its therapeutic value, but more on its diagnostic purpose. So the early history of bloodletting can also be traced back to the early Egyptians. Okay? So during that time, apart from blood, urine and feces were also collected. However, it was collected for examination of uh, whatever is ailing the patient. No? But blood or the process of letting it out of the body was once thought to rid the body of disease and provide a cure for almost all ailments. Can you believe that? So in the 12th century, bloodletting was practiced by uh, barbers whose red and white barber poles became the symbol of their trade with a white, uh, with a red rather, you know, the red marks here okay, stand for blood and the white you know, lines stand for uh, bandages or the tourniquet you know, that were used. Okay? And the pole itself uh, refers to the stick grass by the patient to assist in dilating the veins in the arms. Okay, so barbers during the medieval period are surgeons as well. No? So in bloodletting, various instruments were used no? uh, to allow blood to escape from the veins. They used uh, simple syringes or uh, lancets or Flames like this. No? So these are bloodletting flames with various sizes, maybe depending on the severity of the infection or disease. Okay? So they also make use of bleeding bowls like this to collect the blood that has escaped. Okay? So there are actually two ancient methods of bloodletting. Okay? So blood can be gathered from uh, cut or lacerated veins like this or it could be gathered from uh, small cuts uh, that were made uh, at the uh, skin on the back and um, collected by suctioning uh, using vacuumized uh, cups. Okay? So those two methods are venesection. So venesection is most common uh, to create the wound, a sharp or Lancet type instrument is used. So the process of cutting the vein is called lancing. So the process itself is actually uh, done whenever the patient is sick, okay? Or it's done to reduce fever if the patient is suffering from a fever, okay? And then we have cupping. So this method is called cupping where glass cups like this are used. So these are heated to create a vacuum, okay? 
So this is quite similar to what we know nowadays as ventosa, okay? uh, but okay, <clears throat> both processes make use of vacuumized uh, cups. Okay? Um, but the difference is that in cupping, okay, multiple blades are used to uh, make wounds or scratches no, on the skin at the back before the vacuumized cup is placed. Okay? So when the vacuumized cup is placed, um, the skin is being suctioned and so blood is being um, suctioned off too. Okay? So it will escape from those scratches that were made prior to attaching the vacuumized cups. So you know, those oozing blood are collected. Okay? So if, of course, some would escape just like this one. Okay? So this is a Flemish woman okay? Collect, performing the process of cupping. Okay? Up close, this is how it would look like. Okay, Nilnig. Okay, so the two uh, ancient methods of bloodletting uh, blood are venesection and uh, cupping. Okay? Next, we have Uncle George. Okay? So George Washington, of course, the first U.S. president, okay? uh, suffered from a severe throat infection before he died. Of course, you know, the treatment that was prescribed is to bleed him out. And he was allowed to bleed nine pints of blood in just 24 hours. And that's so much blood to lose in one day. Nine pints is about four liters of blood. So that's too much. So what do you expect? So he died. He died soon after. Okay? So he died on December 14, 1799, most probably due to uh, massive blood loss that resulted to shock and, of course, consequently his death, or okay, his throat infection might have had complications too. You know? So uh, maybe it had spread okay? and he was uh, actually suffering from septicemia, but there was no way of knowing that then. Okay? If he had, if he's alive now, he would have just been prescribed. Uh, uh, antiseptic gargle like Bactidol and probably some oral antibiotics and lozenges maybe like Biflam or even probably Strepsils. Uh, so, okay. But it was good actually that it happened that way because okay, right after his death, okay, the philosophy of phlebotomy as a therapeutic tool began to take uh, turn began it began to change okay so in the mid 19th century okay so the mid 19th century brought us the golden era of scientists now all over the globe okay so in the field of medicine particularly medical microbiology scientists such as louis pasteur okay contributed so much. He discovered that microorganisms caused fermentation and disease. Okay? So the vital knowledge that he was able to acquire saved the industries of beer making, wine making, and even silk industries. Yeah? He also originated the process of pasteurization, which is a process of partial sterilization. We use that for sterilizing very uh, delicate products like uh, dairy, right? which is quite sensitive to heat. So you can't sterilize them too long because they, it would damage the product. Okay? He was also able to develop vaccines against anthrax and rabies. John Snow. Okay? John Snow is considered as um, one of the founders of modern epidemiology because he was able to trace the source of a cholera outbreak in London. Okay, the tracing technique that he used back then served as the building blocks of the processes we use in today's epidemiologic techniques. Okay. Florence Nightingale on this side is, of course, the foundational philosopher of modern nursing. 
her advocacy was to maintain a clean environment to help reduce mortality rate. And then this one is Carl Landsteiner. Does it ring a bell? Okay. Carl Landsteiner discovered the major blood groups, no? blood types A, B, and O. And he developed the ABO system of blood typing. Okay. So because of his contribution, uh, blood transfusion today is a routine medical practice. No? So during the, the mid 19th century, the breakthrough in the field of microbiology, as well as immunology, allow the scientists and physicians to have a source or causative agent for a disease okay, that they could address and treat rather than just allow the patients to bleed out, right? So with this breakthroughs, um, pharmaceuticals or drugs, no, medicinal drugs came in the light. So also, uh, helped us cure for diseases. Then blood, as well as other body fluids, gained their diagnostic utility. So they're not therapeutic anymore, but they are diagnostic. Okay? So blood and other body fluids were collected not to cure the patients, but to help determine the cause of a patient's condition or illness. Then we have leeches. No? So Hirudo medicinalis. This is the scientific name of this uh, European medicinal leech. So it's, it's one of the several species of uh, medicinal leeches. Okay? So these leeches produce substances with uh, various therapeutic benefits like uh, anticoagulants, anti-inflammatory, anesthetic, thrombolytic, uh, vasodilators, you know, anti-edematous. Uh, they also produce substances that are bacteriostatic and blood and lymph circulation enhancing uh, properties. So that's why a lot of doctors, you know, medical doctors, believe in using leeches. Okay? So up until today, they actually make use of these suckers. <laughs> like when a person's finger is reattached after an uh, accidental amputation, you know, normal blood flow in the arteries as well as in the veins don't occur immediately. So sometimes the blood tends to pull at the portion where the reconnection was made. Okay? So it, it would cause pain and pressure. So a leech is usually placed on that area you know, to remove excess blood and relieve the uh, patient of the symptoms. Okay? Just like this one, there's an infection here. Okay, so uh, they place leeches on that area. Okay. So what about phlebotomy in today's time? Okay? So primarily phlebotomy today is utilized for the detection of abnormalities and diseases. No? So we obtain blood for diagnostic purposes and to monitor uh, prescribed treatment. No? Uh, we use it to remove blood for transfusions at uh, uh, blood banks or donor centers. Okay? However, phlebotomy still has a therapeutic purpose, as in the case of polycythemia vera. Okay, so polycythemia vera is a type of malignancy where there's an excessive production of RBCs or red blood cells. So the increased number of RBCs make the blood sticky, which means it cannot readily flow you know, along the arteries and may impede the delivery of oxygen to the cells or tissue. So uh, this may cause also formation of unnecessary clots, which could cause blockages in the uh, blood vessels. So regularly, individuals with polycythemia vera undergo therapeutic phlebotomy to reduce the number of red blood cells in their system. So sometimes uh, the volume is uh, around, uh, same with uh, the usual blood uh, donation volume, about 500 ml. Okay. So apart from PCV or polycythemia vera, uh, phlebotomy is also used for treatment or uh, relief of uh, symptoms of hereditary hemochromatosis. No? Hereditary hemochromatosis. It's a 
uh, disorder in which the body can build up too much iron in the skin or even the heart, liver, pancreas, sometimes uh, pituitary glands, and even the joints can be affected as well. So regularly scheduled blood removal is uh, believed to be effective as a way to lower the amount of iron in the body. So today, there are two types of phlebotomy that we can perform in the laboratory as med techs. Okay? So we can perform venipuncture, you know, like this one that you see in the picture. So we collect blood from the veins. And we can also perform capillary puncture you know, for CBC or platelet counts, for example. So we collect uh, blood by uh, puncturing you know, um, the tip of the fingers, okay? so capillary puncture. We don't perform arterial puncture. No? Med techs are not allowed to uh, perform arterial blood collection. Okay? So we are limited to venipuncture and capillary puncture. Okay, so who does the process of phlebotomy? Okay? That would be, of course, the phlebotomist. Okay. So the role of the phlebotomist is important in the field of diagnostic medicine. They don't just collect blood. You know, they collect blood with utmost reliability and accuracy. So even during uh, collection, correct procedure must be performed to ensure the quality of the sample collected or obtained. So being the one who has uh, direct contact with the patients, okay, the phlebotomist represents the lab, okay? So it is important to uphold appropriate attitude in terms of patient care at all times. Now, phlebotomy can be centralized or decentralized. So what do we mean by that, okay? So when we say centralized uh, phlebotomy, Blood collection or the process of phlebotomy is done purely by the phlebotomist. Okay, so even if there are uh, several patients waiting in line in need for extraction, the phlebotomist can divide them into batches and collect the blood himself or herself. Okay, now the phlebotomist may be stationed in the OPD station of the laboratory, or the phlebotomist can be dispatched to collect blood in wards, okay? So centralized because only the phlebotomist does blood collection or phlebotomy. Now, when we say decentralized, other people that are certified you know, or has undergone training for phlebotomy can also perform it, you know, even if it's not a medical technologist. In the U.S. and some specialized laboratories here in the country, there are some phlebotomists who are actually nurses okay, or uh, graduates of associate courses in health that has undergone and has been certified uh, by a certifying body to perform phlebotomy. Okay, so shared responsibility. Now, that's what it means, not decentralized. It's not just the phlebotomist who collects blood. So other people, as long as they uh, have undergone training for phlebotomy and are certified you know, by a certifying body, he or she can perform blood collection. Okay? So when we say centralized, the sole collector of blood specimen is the phlebotomist. When we say decentralized, other health workers, as long as they are certified to perform phlebotomy, can perform the process, okay? Now, which of the two is most commonly applied? What do you think, okay? So looking at this pie chart, okay, centralized phlebotomy is of course performed most of the time or preferred most of the time, okay? So that uh, retracing any problems okay, is easier. Okay, so uh, centralized meaning again that only the phlebotomist performs blood collection. Okay, only fifteen percent okay, of health institutions uh, perform decentralized phlebotomy. 
Okay. Now, what about the future of phlebotomy? Okay. So, phlebotomy can now be done with the aid of infrared vein finder. Wow, life is uh, being made so easy for the phlebotomist. Okay. So, this will help eliminate cases of blind shooting. Okay. You know what blind shooting means? Sometimes no, we think that we have found the vein and then uh, once we have punctured okay, uh, or inserted the needle, we lose track of the vein. We can't extract blood. Okay? And so we, uh, we do some sort of uh, stitching to find where that collapsed vein is. Okay? So with the use of this um, instrument, you know, like the infrared vein finder, okay, this one, okay? or this one. So it's easy to track where the vein goes, okay? See, so if you lose one, you can easily find another, okay? But of course, we try as much as possible to collect where we started, okay? And there's also robotic, uh, a robotic phlebotomist, okay? So accuracy is usually around 98 to 100%, okay? So that's the future of phlebotomy. Okay, now moving on to our next topic, we have hospital areas in and the healthcare setting. Okay, so we have here ancillary hospital areas. Of course, most if not all of us have been inside a hospital. No, and we know uh, what it looks like from inside. Of course, there are people who run the hospitals but are not directly involved with the patient, no, the admin. Okay? So we have administrative offices. Of course, we have uh, the um, electrocardiography, electrocardiography section okay? or the uh, EKG. Okay? So this is... Um, usually responsible for monitoring patients with cardiovascular diseases. It's also known as a heart station, commonly known as heart station in the Philippines. Okay? Uh, medics are in charge. Now, during our time, we do the uh, EKG, okay? but it would be the physician who'd read you know, the graphs. Okay? And then we have electroencephalography, so this area is for diagnosing neurophysiological disorders, okay? And then we have environmental services, which is responsible for uh, trash, no? Or the flow of traffic when it comes to trash, where, is, where trash is collected, where it is delivered, where it is stored, and how it is disposed, okay? And then food service or dietary, which is responsible for uh, the food, no? Of inpatients. Okay. And then GI laboratory, we don't really have that uh, in the Philippines, a separate laboratory just for GI. In some specialized hospitals, they have a gastrointestinal laboratory where they perform endoscopy, and then they process the samples right there. Okay. What, what we have here is a clinical laboratory. Okay. So... Um, the endoscopy may be performed in the ER or the patient's room, and then the samples are just deliver, delivered to the laboratory. Okay? And then, of course, medical records, that's where we retrieve our um, records. Okay? And the nursing services, occupational therapy, uh, pharmacy, of course, we know what that is for, uh, physical therapy. Okay? So uh, this provides the therapy to restore mobility for those who had trouble uh, walking after suffering from a stroke. No? And then we have radiology. So this is where we go when we need to get an x-ray or CT scan or MRI. Okay? And then there's respiratory therapy. So this provides uh, therapy to evaluate lung function. Okay? And then speech therapy. So in the Philippines, it's a different setting altogether. Okay, uh, sometimes there are separate uh, facilities for OT and speech therapy, you know, occupational therapy and speech therapy. There's a scarcity of this 
practitioners actually. You know, so sometimes we only have uh, those from Manila and then they come in to Mindanao you know, and then schedule. You know. So minsan ang haba ng pila for speech therapists and OTs you know, because there's so little of them practicing here in the Philippines. Okay. And then of course we know what central supply is. So that's where uh, health workers like nurses, lab aides, uh, nurse aides get uh, fresh beddings, okay, fresh linens. Okay, that's where that's where they uh, gather those things. Uh, uh, that's where you collect cotton if you run out of it, uh, gauze pads. Okay, so that's where we collect those materials. Okay, so these are pictures of some of those that I have mentioned. Of course, the laboratory, the EEG or the electroencephalography station, mm -hmm. the PT station, the GI lab, okay, the RT, and then the heart station or the electrocardiography uh, department. Okay? So usually this one is a med tech. This one here is a med tech. Now we do this, okay? So we put on the leads across the patient's chest uh, and then on the wrists, left and right, and the ankles, left and right, okay? Then we have areas of nursing and type of care, no? So we have coronary care unit. So this is a unit in the hospital that takes care of patients who has had a heart attack or myocardial infarctions or, or those who had treatments involving their heart, like those who had uh, open heart surgeries. Okay? So that's where they are usually uh, put you know, or placed. And then we have, of course, the ER, which is the busiest room or area. And then geriatric okay, for the Lolos and the Lolas, the home health care unit, ICU. So we have several types of ICUs you know, in the hospital. We have NICU for newborn, we have PICU for pediatrics and so on. And then we have the nursery. We have nephrology area, neurology area, uh, obstetrics, oncology or for cancer patients, orthopedics, or for those with broken bones, pediatrics for kids, recovery. You know? So this is an area where uh, patients who, had, who just had surgery are placed. You know, to allow them to recover before they are they are placed into their respective rooms, and then of course surgery or OR, okay, and then for the laboratory, okay, so the areas in the lab are the following. We also have administrative areas inside the lab, so the office of the chief med tech, the office of the a head of the lab or the pathologist. No? Of course, the receiving and the releasing area, this is usually uh, the first area that you come across with when you enter the lab. Okay? That's where you submit your samples and that's where you get your results. Okay? And then the phlebotomy area, this is where they have that special seat or special chair for you to sit on when you have your uh, blood collection procedure. Hematology is one of the busiest area no? because CBC is one of the most common tests requested. Okay, so this is where we process samples for CBC. Then we have the clinical chemistry area also busy. So this is where we process samples for FBS, no? for uh, electrolytes, what else? For uh, liver function tests. No? And and then immunology and serology, this is where we perform um, HIV tests. Yeah? And then we have uh, clinical microscopy, also another busy area. This is also known as the urinalysis and parasitology department or area in the laboratory. So this is where we process urine samples and stool samples. Okay? Of course, microbiology. So this is where we do culture and sensitivity to identify microbial agents. Histopathology, this is actually an area that, separate, that is separated from the general lab, okay? So this is where we also, uh, we can also find the office of the pathologist. So this is the area where we uh, 
uh, process human samples, you no know, whole organs, tissues that are submitted. This is also where we perform um, immunohistochemistry. Yeah. And then blood banking. So this is the area where we do uh, compatibility tests prior to transfusion of the blood. This is also where we can keep blood. Okay? Uh, cytogenetics, this is an area in the lab where we perform tests to identify uh, genetic abnormalities. Uh, cytology is that area in the lab where we process uh, samples, uh, that may contain cells that are uh, carrying signs of um, malignancy. No? So this is where we perform pap smears. And, but in the Philippines, uh, cytology is a part of histopathology. So this is also where we perform um, pap smears. Okay. And then molecular diagnostics. So this is where you can find the PCRs, no? the RT-PCR machines, uh, what vortex machines and all those things. Uh, and then coagulation. So they're in red because this is, these are actually new areas, no? newly added areas in the lab. So coagulation area, this is uh, originally just a part of hematology. So this is where we perform tests to identify bleeding problems, uh, uh, clotting time, bleeding time, et cetera. Okay. And so this area here is hematology section. Okay. So you can see uh, posters no? or images of different red blood cells or different uh, formed cells in the blood to check. This is vital. Even here in the Uripara department, you, know, you can see posters of the different formed elements in the urine and the different uh, forms of parasitic eggs to help us identify them when we see them in the samples. Okay. And then this is histopath department. You know, so you'll know that it is because you can find the uh machines that are used to process them no so microtomes cryostat okay so cryostat is a machine that we use for uh frozen section it's a rapid method of processing samples by freezing them okay and then uh what else this is of course um uh, microbiology no molecular diagnostic department uh, this is microbio because of the uh, agar that you see, uh, the plates of agar that you see. And this is the mol bio section of the lab. This is the blood bank area of the lab. Okay. Now moving on to our next topic. So uh, we have the three phases of the testing process or the laboratory testing cycle. Okay, so there are technically three parts of the cycle or the testing process. We have the pre-analytic or the pre-examination. Okay, so everything that happens before actual testing, uh, actually testing the samples fall under pre-analytic or pre-examination. Then we have the analytic or the examination um, phase. This is where actual testing of the samples are done. And then we have post-analytic or post-examination. So this uh, is where everything that happens after the actual testing is included, like reporting, you no know, generation of reports, uh, keeping of records, um, submission or distribution of reports or results. And that's post-analytic or uh, post-examination. So let's take a look at them more closely. No? But remember, regardless of the phase of examination no? or phase of testing process, accuracy and reliability must be maintained all throughout. Okay? So this ensures that the quality of results generated will help provide accurate diagnosis. So with accurate diagnosis, Proper treatment will be administered to the patient and thus 
there's an increased chance that the patient may recover from his or her illness or sickness. So let's take a look at them more closely. So what is included in the pre-analytical phase? But before we go into that, okay, remember that good service in the laboratory begins with the personnel. So it is important that those who are tasked to collect and process samples are competent professionals, okay? So before collecting samples, a test request is necessary, okay? So it would contain all the information that we need to know about the patient and the test that's being requested by uh, the physician, okay? So reading the request form allows us to prepare the necessary materials or equipment that we need during collection, okay? Next, proper, uh, proper identification of the patient. This is done by asking the patient to state his name. Don't go asking, are you for Dapia Dima Pawalang Sala? And what if the patient says yes, only to find out that her name was actually Pia Manan Sala, which sounds familiar, okay? So the patient may have not heard you properly and have misidentified herself. So instead, ask, what is your name, ma'am or ma'am? May I know your name? So this way, uh, it is the patient who has confirmed his identity by stating his own name. Okay, so doing it that way, you could also check on the patient's condition, whether the patient is coherent or not, or is uh, under the influence of alcohol or is uh, uh, intoxicated. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, you do that to check, you know, if the patient is actually uh, suitable for collection, okay? So if the patient is unconscious, say for example, uh, the patient is uh, an inpatient or the patient is in the ER, okay? And unconscious, you can check the wristband for the identification and confirm with the watcher. Plus confirm it with the uh, ER nurse or the ER doctor on duty. Okay, then we have correct sample collection. This is important, okay? So correct, uh, collect the correct sample. If you need blood, then collect through venipuncture or uh, peripheral puncture or skin puncture, okay? capillary puncture, okay? If you need to perform uh, urine analysis, of course, per, or gather or ask the patient to submit urine sample, okay? So correct sample collection, okay? Remember that the quality of result is as good as the quality of the sample that has been processed, okay? So uh, when we ensure the accuracy and reliability of the procedure, during collection, we reduce the risk of erroneous testing in the examination phase. It would help us save a lot of time, effort, and materials. Okay? So when we give inappropriate or substandard or poor quality samples, it will create a domino effect. You know? So wrong sample, inaccurate result, inaccurate diagnosis, inaccurate treatment, poor prognosis of the patient. And it could even lead to death, okay? Next, correct use of equipment, of course, no? So uh, if your uh, equipment is reusable, clean it after using it, be responsible. Dili mag, dinamak, okay? Sometimes there are samples that are sent in the lab from another facility, no? So receiving those samples are all, also part of the pre-analytical or pre-examination phase. So sample receipt and accessioning is also very important. No? So when you receive the samples, check the container, no? check for leaks, check if it's a proper container for that sample, and of course, check the request form. No? Check if both the container label and the request form have the same information. And if they do have the same information, make sure to attach matching accession numbers. So accession numbers are given to all samples that enter the lab, okay? So these are those stickers you find on containers or tubes with barcodes or QR codes, okay? So this will be useful for easy retrieval and processing, okay? Then proper 
uh, preparation of sample as well as maintenance of its integrity. Okay, so procedures like uh, centrifugation, aliquot preparation, and sample evaluation are included in this part. Okay, remember to follow the prescribed protocol for preparing each type of specimen. Of course, evaluate the quality and the quantity of samples by checking the container, no? the volume, say for example, uh, urine. No? Make sure that at least three-fourths of the bottle is filled with urine samples. You can also check the consistency, like for sputum specimen, for example. Okay, so make sure that it's really sputum or phlegm and not just saliva. Okay, uh, when there is a delay in testing, it is necessary to store and preserve the samples to avoid erroneous results. So this is where we uh, maintain you know, the integrity of the samples. You know, remember that biologic specimens are not stable. They start to disintegrate or decompose once taken out of the body, okay? So common storage is done at refrigerator temperature of about two to eight degrees Celsius, uh, usually when the delay is just within one to two hours, okay? Optimally, preservation can be done at freezing temperatures, about eight, negative 18 to negative 20 degrees Celsius. However, okay, it depends on the type of specimen and test that will be done on the samples. For microbiologic tests like culture, uh, especially if the sample is CSF and you're trying to look for organisms that cause meningitis, do not refrigerate or freeze the samples, okay? Bacterial organisms are very sensitive to cold temperatures, especially those that cause meningitis, so they'll die, okay? If you're looking for, or if you're trying to retrieve or isolate viruses, then freezing them would be the best option. You know? So it depends on uh, the sample, the organism that you're trying to find, and uh, what else? You now the condition. Okay. Then analytical phase. Okay? So in the analy analytical phase, this includes sample testing, okay? and then maintaining uh, testing equipment and reagents. So remember to check uh, expiration dates for the reagents, check the labels before putting them into uh, those containers that you will be using. And of course, for the machines, no? machines are really, really expensive. A lot of them cost millions. Okay, so practice preventive maintenance for all lab machines. So this means do not tire out your machines. No? Some labs that have a considerable number of samples for daily processing, say some labs that can process 500 samples a day, they usually have two sets of the machines that will perform the test. No? So this is so that the machines can take a day off alternatively um, this would avoid damage from excessive use, okay? Also check, remember, uh, a lot of these machines would require air conditioning. So the air con in the lab is not really turned off, okay, because of the machines, no? Not really because of the people. The, you know, the personnel goes, uh, becomes secondary. It's because of the machines that are there that costs uh, millions and millions of pesos. Okay, they, uh, they would require uh, a cool, uh, dry place you know, you know, to keep them running. Okay? Also, remember to perform uh, QCs, you know? so quality control, uh, quality control tests. Uh, it's usually run uh, every shift. You know, so they do QC test. This is really helpful in determining the performance of the machines or the uh, reagents. You know? So if there are any problems, you can easily uh, check it when you do uh, QCs. Okay? Then we have the post-analytical phase. Okay? So the post-analytical phase includes reporting of the results, no? so uh, ensuring accuracy and reliability of delivery of results, follow-up, repeat testing, sometimes 
Uh, we process samples with problems, so we do repeat testings, or we address physicians' uh, concerns. You know? And then, of course, this also includes storage of samples after examination. Okay, so the results that are generated during testing are meant to be reported or released only to authorized people. So if we could release them to the patient himself or an authorized person you know, uh, sent by the patient or the physician. Okay, so we are not allowed to interpret the results for the patient if they ask. Okay? They should uh, go to their physician and ask the physician for the interpretation of the results. Okay? What else? We also do not discard the samples right away. We allow at least about 24 hours before disposal because there are times when repeat testing is necessary. Okay, and then storage may be done at room temperature about 22 to 25 degrees Celsius and then ref temperature or freezing temperature depending on what is appropriate again for the sample. Okay. Next part of the program is of course the laboratory personnel. Okay. So who are the people in the lab? So we have the pathologist. The pathologist is, of course, the head of the laboratory. Okay? So he oversees everything that is done in the laboratory. Then we have the chief med tech. No? So the chief med tech supervises the uh, med techs and the technicians in the performance of their tasks. Also, it is the workload of the chief med tech to arrange the schedules of the people, okay? Uh, the chief med tech also assists in uh, necessary revisions in the different methods that are applied or used in the lab. You know? uh, he or she supervises the maintenance of lab records and reports, and of course, participates in the selection as well as training of the personnel. Then we have the med tech, and actually, you know, the med tech is in charge of or is responsible for performing the tests you know, needed to be done in the laboratory. Okay? A laboratory technician or medical technician uh, can perform general tests under the supervision, of course, of the med tech. Okay? And then... Uh, what else? Phlebotomist. No? So the phlebotomist provides or collects blood samples for uh, laboratory procedures no? for testing. Okay. Then we have the histotechnologist. Okay? So the histotechnologist prepares uh, body tissue samples for microscopic examination by the pathologist. So the histotechnologist, which is technically uh, med techs no, here in the Philippines. Okay? Even phlebotomists are technically med techs here in the Philippines. In other country, they can assign uh, phlebotomists that are not med tech graduates, histotechnologists that are not med tech graduates. But here in the Philippine setting, uh, it is required that those who perform uh, phlebotomy and prepare slides of human tissues should be graduates of uh, medical technology. Okay, so we prepare, histotechnologists prepare the slides. Now we do the cutting, the sectioning, the staining, and the mounting of the sections on glass slides. Okay, so that when the uh, pathologist comes in, he will only need to view those slides under the microscope. Okay, and then we have the cytotechnologist, again, which is technically a med tech in the Philippines. Okay, in other countries, this could be graduates of other health related courses and are just trained in histotechnology. Okay, so a cytotechnologist examines cells to detect signs of cancer. Of course, the uh, results reported by the cytotechnologist will be checked by the pathologist. So they work hand in hand with the pathologist. Okay. Next part is the 
patients' rights. No? So in all that we do in our workplace, no, the laboratory, we must always uphold and honor the patient's rights. No? Failure to recognize their rights and honor their rights may result to a lawsuit filed against us by our patients. We don't want that to happen. Okay, so what are the patient's rights? So number one, the patient has a right to appropriate medical care and humane treatment. Okay, so the patient has the right to appropriate health care and medical care of good quality. So there should be no discrimination kahit na mukhang walang ligo ang pasyente. Okay, so there should be no discrimination if any... Uh, if the patient cannot be uh, provided treatment immediately, okay? so of course, depending on his state of health, they should be or he should be uh, directed to wait or um, he or she could be referred to another facility elsewhere. Okay? So uh, provided that it's not an emergency case. However, if patients in are in an emergency situation, no, so we should, the hospital or the facility should immediately extend uh, medical help or medical care. Okay? Kahit na wala pang deposit. No? So treatment should be provided in emergency cases without any deposit or any form of advanced payment for treatment. Mm, sure. Okay, so that's the patient's rights. Dapat walang deposit, lalo na pag emergency. Okay? Next, right to informed consent. So the patient will not be subjected or should not be subjected to any procedure without his consent. Okay, so the patient has a right to the information about his condition, the treatment and the procedures that he needs to undergo, the risks of those procedures, matay ba siya when he does the procedure, okay, the side effects, and the recovery. You know, if there are any problems that have been recorded you know, in the recovery period. Okay? Remember, those information should be shared to the patient in a manner and language that the patient can understand. English and English hindi naman naiintindihan ng pasyente. Okay? So we have to uh, make sure that the patient understands his rights para walang problema. Okay? So, uh, but there's an exception. No? So uh, say, for example, emergency case no? where uh, there is risk of physical injury or decline or death if the treatment is withheld or postponed. Okay? So in such cases, the physician can perform any diagnostic procedure as good practice of medicine dictates, no? even without consent. Okay? And then what else? Uh, if ordered by law, okay? If it is ordered by law, okay? So, uh, kailangan i-perform niya yun. So, uh, even without his consent, will be forced to do the procedure because it was in the name of justice, okay? And then what else? Uh, when the patient is either a minor or legally incompetent, like uh, mentally incapacitated ang pasyente, okay? So the informed consent may be uh, secured from uh, a third party, like the spouse or uh, a child no, of legal age or the parent or sibling of legal age or legal guardian, okay? Then... The patient has the right to privacy and confidentiality. So the privacy of the patients must be assured at all stages of his treatment. No? The patient has the right to be free from unwanted public exposure. Ayun yung maging sikat. Ginawa mong sikat dahil chinismis mo yung kanyang sakit. Okay? So bawal yun. So healthcare providers or practitioners involved in the treatment of the patient and all those who have legitimate access to the patient's record are not authorized to divulge any information to a third party who has no concern whatsoever about the patient's condition. Okay? So, except, okay? 
So we can disclose information if it will benefit uh, public health and safety, okay? or when it is again dictated by law, or like what we have uh, experienced during the first few months of COVID-19, when it is needed for continued medical treatment or advancement of medical science, provided that the subject is de-identified. No? So remember, can you still remember during the first few months of COVID-19 uh, around, or, um, when was that? March to June of 2020, when they were identifying and tracing the first few patients of COVID-19 from different areas. So they just named them patient X, patient Y, patient 441. Okay. They use numbers to identify the patient. Okay. So that's uh, allowed okay, to share medical information of an individual if it's in the interest of the public, provided that the patient is, uh, the patient's identity is not disclosed. So that's okay. Okay. Next, the patient has the right to information. So what information? Okay. Information about, again, his illness, uh, the treatment plan, uh, the required tests or procedures to be done, the risk that goes with it if it's done. Of course, the most important thing is that the patient should be informed of the cost okay, or the payment scheme. Okay, the benefits, okay, like uh, SSS, no? PhilHealth, GSIS. So what can you get from uh, those things? Okay? Uh, Post-hospitalization instructions as well. You know? And then next, the patient has the right to choose healthcare the healthcare provider and the facility that he wants, okay? so except when he is a, an inmate or a prisoner. Okay, so remember, uh, once you are in that uh, situation, you have all your rights, you know, civil rights are uh, removed. Okay, so you cannot choose your doctor. Okay, so we have you no. Know, so other than that, the patient has the right to choose. You no. Know, uh, the hospital or the doctor that he wants to consult with, or uh, if he wants to ask for a second opinion, he can do so. You know, the, the first physician should not, does not have the right to stop the patient from asking other doctors you know, about his condition or illness. Okay. Next, the patient has the right to self-determination. Okay. So the patient has the right to avail you know, of any recommended diagnostic and, uh, uh, and treatment procedures, you know? um, any person of legal age and of sound mind may make an advanced written directive for physicians to administer terminal care when he or she suffers from terminal phases of a terminal illness like uh, terminal stage of cancer. Okay? So an example of this is uh, the DNR form or the do not resuscitate form. So patients in the terminal stage of cancer okay, and their relatives or family are asked whether they would like their patients to be revived if in the case of flatline. Siya, no? So if they want to have, it, uh, have the patient revived, then okay, you know? so when it flatlines, they do CPR and do the fibrillation, okay? or if it's really uh, the end stage and there's nothing to be done about it, the family can sign that. You know? It's a form of waiver that um, inhibits the physician from resuscitating the patient you know? once the patient flatlines. Okay. So I actually first-handedly experienced that. No? So my mother died of renal carcinoma, and she was already on the uh, last stage. Okay. So we were asked if we wanted her to be revived, you know? uh, but it was already uh, the end stage, and uh, senior citizen na rin, no? hindi nakakayani ng uh, chemotherapy. Okay? So we signed. 
the DNR form. Okay? So that she could rest comfortably whenever uh, it happens. And it did happen you know, after some time. So we had that. You know? So patients are given that right to choose whether or not you want to be revived. Okay? And if you cannot do it anymore, your family members may decide it for you and sign the waiver. Okay? And then next, what else? Really, right to religious belief. So the patient has the right to refuse medical treatment or procedures, which may be contrary to uh, his or her religious beliefs. Okay? So recall uh, descendants of the sun, uh, key drama. Okay? Remember when they had to treat the Arab president? Okay? So initially, the secretary of the Arab president or the chief of staff does not want no, the Koreans to uh, treat uh, the Korean president because it should only be the Arab surgeon who should attend to the Arab president. Okay, so that is dictated by their law. However, the uh, Arab president is in an emergency state. So again, it's an exception to the rule. Okay, also another exemption in this case is when the patient is a minor. Okay, so the parents cannot just uh, decide no, that they will not perform this even if it would help the child. So sometimes the attending physician and even the chief no, uh, of the hospital okay, um, may intervene. Okay? But again, pinag-uusapan lang naman din yan. Okay, next, what else are their rights? No? So we have uh, right to medical records, of course. No? So those are your records and uh, people should have the right to view it you know, if it is their own uh, medical records. Okay, next, the right to leave the hospital or to leave the um, health facility. Okay, so the patient has the right to leave the hospital or any facility or any healthcare institution, regardless of his physical condition, okay? So long as he is informed of the medical consequences of his decision and that he should sign a waiver that would release his physician and the nurses from any obligation relative to the consequences of his decision, okay? Also, okay, patients, uh, are allowed to leave okay, if his decision will not affect public health and safety. Okay? Um, usually, the problem with this is uh, it would be a loss, you know, financial loss on the part of the institution. So what is usually done is that uh, the patients are allowed to leave provided that they're able to uh, provide appropriate arrangements no, uh, about how the bills will be settled. So they can go and talk over okay, about paying bi-monthly. No? So it depends. Okay? So as long as they were able to accomplish that, they are allowed to leave the hospital premises. Next, okay, um, the right to refuse participation in medical research or clinical trials, of course. No? So all of us have the right to refuse participating in medical research. We don't want to be lab rats, okay? but it depends on the patient. You know? So if he thinks it would be beneficial on his part, no, and nobody is, uh, in, uh, is urging him to join or pushing him to join or forcing him to join, then by all means, he can uh, proceed with the participation. Okay? Provided, of course, that everything about the medical research is legal and approved, not duly approved. Next, the patient has the right to correspondence and to receive visitors. Okay? So the patient has the right to communicate with relatives and other persons and, as, uh, and to receive visitors, of course, except, you know, except if the patient is um, under isolation. 
Okay, so if the patient is under source isolation, this means that the patient is infected with a condition that can cause other people to be sick. No? So say he has missiles or he has uh, chicken pox. So the patient has to be isolated so as not to uh, spread infection to other people. So no visitors allowed. Okay? Or... It could also be when the patient is in reverse isolation. No? This is usually uh, done on people that are immune compromised. Okay? So reverse isolation means that the patient inside is protected from getting sick because his immune system cannot endure uh, those infectious agents. Okay, so uh, the visitors may come in and spread no, viruses or bacteria that may cause uh, severe infections to the individual or the patient. Okay, so that's the only exception. Next, okay, the right to express grievances. Okay? So the patient has the right to complain or to express grievances about um, the injustice that he or she felt while in the care of the facility or the poor uh, services that they have endured while they were in the hospital, okay? They should be free to complain, okay? And then lastly, you know, the patient has the right to be informed of his rights and obligations as a patient, you know? So, all of us has the right to be informed of our rights and our obligations as a patient. It is the duty of the healthcare institution or the hospital to inform us of our rights, as well as to inform us of what are the do's and the don'ts in the institution. Okay, so that we could also uh, do it you know, while we are there in the laboratory. We can follow it while we are there in the hospital. Okay, so these are the rights of the patients. I took this from this uh, website. No? I posted this here because I want you to go and visit and read more about this uh, patient's rights. So there are explanation after each subheading. No? So you can read more of them, more about this in this um, web page. Okay, so it's from the Department of Health, Government of the Philippines. Okay. Moving on to our next topic, we have professional attitude. Okay, so professional attitude includes recognizing diversity. Okay. Uh, people are not made of a single mold. We are... Uh, different. No, we are all unique. We have different attitudes. We have different characteristics. We have different characters. Okay? So we have to accept that truth. Okay? However, even if you're different, we have to be professional. So show self-confidence. No? Uh, make sure to uh, be true to what you are saying. No? So uh, uphold your integrity, be compassionate, be kind, okay? be self-motivated, okay? uh, be dependable. Okay? Make sure because the patients come in scared you know, um, of the jab or of the <laughs> syringe. Okay? Huwag mo namang ipakita na mas nahadlok pa ka sa ilan, nagkurog-kurog imong kamot. Okay? Be brave. Okay? Show them that they can depend on you. Okay? They are already hurt and they don't want to be hurt some more because you are scared to uh, do phlebotomy. Okay? And of course, practice ethical behavior. Okay? Dapat magalang ano, uh, pagkaharap ang pasyente. Okay? Show that you are confident para mapanatag din ang loob ng ating mga pasyente. Okay? So remember to put yourselves into their shoes. Empathize. Okay? So usually, the way we address them, the way we carry ourselves also affect our patients. Okay? Most of the time, they come in apprehensive and worried no? when they go to the lab. 
Okay, to have their samples collected. Of course, no, that's understandable. That's expected. Sakit, matusukan. Okay? Ang pinakatalawan, matusukan, kay ang medtech report. Okay? So, it's important that whenever we face our patients, we must have a welcoming aura, no, regardless of their attitudes towards us. Okay? Remember, we can never be in control of the things happening around us, but we can always control our reactions towards uh, the situation. Okay, kaya, no? keep calm and tusok lang. Okay, next and the last topic, no? professional grooming. Okay, so this is the part that tells us how we should carry ourselves, no? how we should dress up. Okay, there should be no visible tattoos. Nobody's stopping you from... Uh, having tattoos. It's just that when you are in your workplace, okay, and when you are carrying a syringe, okay, as much as possible, don't show your uh, skull tattoos no, uh, to your patients, especially to children. Okay, so keep them away from other people's sight. You can, you can uh, flaunt them when you're in the beach or in other places, but when you're when you're in your workplace, keep your tattoos. No, nobody piercing other than your earrings. And of course, when you are wearing earrings, avoid wearing anything that's too dangling or uh, those large loops that you can uh, actually fit your uh, the crown of your head because it's too big. Okay, so we wear studs. Okay. And nail art is not allowed, okay? So fingernails should not be longer than uh, a fourth of an inch, okay? From the tip of your fingers, okay? No blue jeans or casual attire. Wear your uniforms, wear your scrubs, wear your lab gowns, no t-shirts or sweatshirts, okay? You can wear your t-shirt under your scrubs if you feel like uh, wearing it you no know, but wear it under your scrubs always make sure that you're in your scrubs or the prescribed uniform for the laboratory of course you no know, no open toed shoes wear closed shoes wear clogs wear crocs okay with socks those things are for your protection. Okay? Remember, you're, you'll be working with glasswares, with chemicals. We don't want to uh, melt your toes when um, hydrochloric acid uh, falls on them. Okay? So uh, keep them safe. Okay? Wear closed shoes. Okay? So uh, remember, this is not intended to discriminate. Okay. Rather, it's a discussion on the appropriate grooming of a medical technologist, a professional. Okay. So there's a standard when it comes to professional conduct. So of course, we must adhere to that conduct, which is expected of our profession. Okay. So that's all for our first session. Thank you for listening and always stay safe.